fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Drama. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. It's 105FM Los Angeles. 102.3FM Riverside. And 1050AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Mike Brown is back from an extended vacation. Yes, extended vacation. I've been uh, work. It's a working vacation. I'm writing another book doing another podcast on top of the one that I've already been working on, so I'm a busy bee. Yeah, yeah, you're too busy. you got to <laughs> slow down for it, you know. It'll all be over soon, so slow down. Yeah, I don't know how to take a vacation. I really don't. Yeah, I don't either. I can't take more than a day off, and I've got, <laughs> got to keep busy. Another guy that's really, really busy, it seems like all the time, it's been since I can remember, it's our guest. And we're quite uh, pleased and honored to have him. His book is called American Autopsy, and it's one medical examiner's decades-long fight for racial justice in a broken legal system. Dr. Michael Bodden, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. What got you into this this kind of a field? First of all, where did it where did it start for you that you got into autopsies and medical examining? Well, that, that's where I started out. My interest was being a, a normal doctor. You know, this was at my mother's uh, persuasion that it'd be nice to be a doctor for a kid to be a doctor. And so uh, I went through uh, born in the Bronx, grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, and, uh, went through school there, went to, uh, City College, New York, uh, confirmed that I wanted to be a physician and medical school at NYU. While in medical school at NYU was associated with Bellevue Hospital, uh, and still is. And, um, also the medical examiner's office in New York, like the coroner's office in, um, in uh, other places in the United States and Canada, was located at Bellevue Hospital. I uh, had a patient die uh, as a medical student that uh, went down to see the autopsy on the patient uh, that I'd taken care of as a medical student and found anatomy uh, just interesting, continued to be invited down there because very few medical students came down there at that time and um, uh, got interested in the anatomy and uh, but still wanted to be a regular internal medicine doctor. And one time as an intern, when um, when I was an intern in, in internal medicine, I had a patient who was a, a heroin addict, spent a lot of time with him. He taught me a lot about uh, how he worked and survived uh, and uh, as a heroin addict in New York City. He had an infection of his heart, and it was a very difficult uh, uh, bacterial endocarditis due to dirty needles, and uh, it was very difficult to uh, cure, and um, I spent a lot of time with him for about six weeks, and we cured him, and then he, uh, a week, weekend later, I came back to uh, the medical examiner's office, and there he was on a um, uh, autopsy table that he had, we spent six weeks curing a very difficult um uh, infectious disease caused by being um, a, a heroin addict. He went out and uh, went back to shooting up, died, and I realized that, hey, we're just getting at uh, at the, the superficial aspects of being a, a heroin addict by treating them, um, their diseases, and we got to get probably going to be more valuable to find out and study why people become heroin addicts. And that way, to, the best way to do that is by doing autopsies and learning from the autopsy on um, hundreds of, uh, of patients rather than a single, pre to single patient. And that sort of swerved me into 
becoming a medical examiner because it was interesting and we could learn a lot from the, and doctors have, pathologists have learned a lot from autopsies that helped thousands of millions of people rather than dealing with one patient at a time. So that's my my route into becoming a uh, medical examiner and forensic pathologist, the, just that one patient that uh, I, uh, we bonded together uh, on treating his the her- the infection caused by heroin, but I hadn't understood that there was a lot more to being a heroin addict than just having infections. And that that leads me now. Since since then, you've become world renowned. I mean, ever since the 1976, uh, you did the reinvestigation of the Martin Luther King assassination, right up till Michael Brown and George Floyd. And uh, did, did you did you expect to become, I guess, so famous in that way? Well, that was that was. Um... That was interesting. You never know uh, how life uh, turns. I uh, went went into becoming uh, a medical examiner after finishing my training at Bellevue Hospital, and the medical examiner's office was right. The new medical examiner's office was built right next to Bellevue. I became chief medical examiner in um, in uh, New York City. That goes back to uh, 1978, uh, yeah, and one of the first persons who died there was uh, a fellow named Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller um, was a uh, Brooklyn businessman, a black businessman, who was a community activist. And um, he comes home one day, uh, one late afternoon, and there's a crowd of people in the neighborhood surrounding two police officers who were having an argument with um, um, his brother. Apparently, um, Arthur Miller's brother uh, was removing trash from the uh, building improperly. Two police officers come over. There's a lot of uh, the community thoughts uh, uh, pressing in on the police. Arthur Miller comes, holds his hands, uh, his arms up, and says to the the crowd to stop. That he's there, he'll take care of it. And the police see that he has a gun. Uh, it's a legal gun that he had. Um, that that he had. They immediately jump on him. He comes to help. No good deed goes unpunished nowadays. They uh, jump on him, bring him to the police car they have. And he said he's heard to say, "I can't breathe, I can't breathe." He gets um, to the to the um, uh, station house, and uh, Arthur Miller is dead. When the autopsy is done, uh, the initial people who work in Brooklyn in the Brooklyn Medical Examiner's Office. Now I'm the chief at that time. Um, said they're going to make the cause of death as a psychosis with exhaustion. Uh, I said, "What do you, What do you mean?" He said, well, that's what we always did when um, uh, when a police officer, somebody died while being restrained by police. Uh, we figured, well, uh, he's um, he excreted too much adrenaline, became psychotic, and died because of that, not what the police did. And I looked at the body, and there was uh, uh, fractures in the uh, windpipe, in the uh, thyroid cartilage, Adam's apple, little petechial hemorrhages in, in the um, eyes, uh, uh, little hemorrhages. Um, uh, finger marks on the neck, and I said, "Well, this is a straightforward uh, uh, cause of death is um, uh, strangulation neck that happened while the uh, police uh, were subduing him." And um, instead of calling it uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, they had uh, psychosis with exhaustion. I had, um, uh, I we said, uh, neck compression, homicide caused by the police. Well, Mayor got a lot of kickback from the police that uh, I wasn't um, uh, a, a team player and I shouldn't blame the police on that, even though clearly from a medical examiner's point of view, that was uh, the the way uh, he died. Um, Ed Potch was the mayor then, uh, demoted me to uh, deputy chief medical examiner uh, because um, he felt I, should, I shouldn't have said that the police caused the death. Uh, about a couple of years later, I get a call from Johnny Cochran, who's just starting out, 
that he had uh, somebody who died during police restraint in uh, uh, Cal- Los Angeles. And could I do a second autopsy? The body's buried, but I, he wants a second autopsy done. The family wants it down in, ten- in Tennessee. And I said, yeah, what's the- why'd you call me? He said, well, he read about my being demoted by uh, Koch because uh, I, uh, you know, uh, disagreed with the police on what the cause of death was. That the- and uh, he was concerned about this um, uh, person, Ron Settles, who was out in uh, uh, Los Angeles. And they shipped the body over, so they shipped the body over, and uh, I did the autopsy. I met Johnny Cochran. I had met uh, Ben Crump on another case while I was chief. And that started their interest in me as a um, uh, a person they called on often when there were uh, deaths uh, of, of people in police custody, many of whom became um, publicly noted um, uh, Eric Garner in New York, uh, uh, Anderson kid who died in uh, Los An- in uh, Florida, and uh, that was one reason why suddenly people started calling me from outside of New York City uh, to do cases, and um, they felt, um, you know, that uh, that I was not just part of the establishment, and unfortunately, doctors. Um, uh, uh, should be independent, but they're, they often consider themselves team players, that the um, uh, police and the prosecutor and the medical examiners work together as a team to get the bad guys, and uh, they expect the medical examiner to go along with it and to, to agree with whatever the police and the prosecutor decide. And that's why you get so many cases now. In fact, now, instead of psychosis with exhaustion, there are a whole lot of other uh, diagnoses like excited delirium, uh, that my co- my, many of my, my colleagues, uh, medical examiners use, which is just a junk science thing, uh, just like, uh, psychosis with a jo- uh, exhaustion with junk science made to, uh, cover up kind of the, um, uh, over- excessive use of force by the police officers that sometimes lead to death. You've heard the term before, Alan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was. Just, I just was thinking about that, and um, I, I I can't help but thinking that it's it's almost become political in a sense. It is political, absolutely. It just says psychosis with exhaustion. It isn't the fault of the police officer who's restraining the guy, George Floyd. They brought that up uh, with uh, at the time. And the guy Prude up in uh, Rochester, New York. Uh, uh, who was also uh, naked running around the streets and uh, when he was restrained just a couple, couple of years ago uh, died why because he couldn't breathe they they say they can't breathe and they can't breathe but uh, and then when they die it's called excited delirium which indicates that he got so excited that he um, his uh, adrenal glands made too much adrenaline and he died from too much adrenaline it was his fault and it had nothing to do with what the police did to him. And I think that's just a, a bad diagnosis that's widely used now by uh, some medical examiners and coroners that uh, increase the kind of social divisions that develop when unnecessary deaths occur, often with, uh, you know, black and brown people. Do you think that uh, those diagnoses are, uh, in you know, is it intentional that they – is it due to, a, like, an unconscious bias, or is, is there, like, a real cover-up happening, do you think? I mean, I, that's, that's speculating. Well, no, I think that – I see what you said. It, it's it, – these are uh, the diagnosis that are welcomed by police and prosecutors and um, the team – Players, the, is the medical examiners, the, the, the thing about a restraint, see, there's, there's an out here, is that when somebody dies because, uh, usually, uh, it's because, uh, it's an individual who's high on drugs or not taking their, uh, schizophrenic medication. They're acting bizarrely. They're running around naked and, uh, they're disturbing the neighbors. The police come. They don't respond to demands that the police have to, you know, to uh, uh, behave themselves. So they are told to put, they're going to take them into the precinct house. 
told to put their hands behind their back so they can uh, handcuff them. Uh, and uh, they refuse. They, they may yet not even understand um, the, the orders that they're given. They're uh, taken to the ground, put on their bellies so they can get their hands behind them and put their wrists together to get the handcuffs on. In order to do that, they got to put pressure on the back. This is prone back pressure, and that prevents the per- us from breathing. The one thing you learn doing autopsies, we have a very thin muscle uh, between our lungs and, and the chest and the abdomen called the diaphragms. The diaphragms are about a, less than a quarter of an inch thick, but they, uh, they go up and down in order to, for us to breathe. They, uh, when they go up, the, the lungs uh, are compressed and they, we breathe out. And when we inhale, uh, is because they go down. So while I'm uh, talking with you right now, our, our diaphragms are going up and down 15 times a minute. If this, uh, if we're down on the uh, ground and there's somebody pressing their knee in my, in their back so they can get my, uh, I'm not being cooperative and get my wrists together, um, it, it pushes the, uh, all the abdominal organs upward. The diaphragms can't come down. That's why people say, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Because in order to breathe, the diaphragms have to go down, but we can still talk. The police believe that if you can talk and say, I can't breathe, it means that uh, you can breathe and that you're just being manipulative and they have that feeling until the person dies. When we, when an autopsy is done, it leaves no marks. See, back compression or compression uh, with the arms around the neck uh, can, uh, may leave no marks on the body. So uh, one can talk oneself into, well, if there's no marks on the body, that means whatever the police did uh, didn't cause their death. And um, they blame, they then blame it on any drugs they took, like cocaine or all that can cause you to have bizarre behavior. Other abnormalities that might be in the body, like uh, uh, some kind of heart disease, which has nothing to do with the death, Sickle crate is used um, as a cause of death when it isn't a cause of death that that's uh, involved pretty much only with black people uh, because um, uh, the the way their uh, genes inherit the sickle trait category, which uh, doesn't cause any harm. Uh, and uh, excited delirium, if you have nothing else, you can blame it on excited delirium, even though there's no proof uh, that that. Um, it even exists as a disease, but it's used by my colleagues and all because uh, they can believe it because they didn't see anything to show uh, uh, that the person died because he couldn't breathe, but we don't find anything in autopsy, and that my contention is that the autopsy has to start at the scene, not in the autopsy table, because things like excited, like uh, asphyxia, inability to breathe, uh, you only know that from... Uh, the scene uh, uh, documentation with witnesses or videos or, or, or body cams, and uh, they may show the cause of death as they did with George Floyd, even though the autopsy doesn't show anything abnormal. When you did the uh, O.J. Simpson case, for instance, was that was that a good move for you, or do you think it was a bad move? Well, it, it's, it's, uh, I think that, uh, medical examiners and forensic pathologists should be willing to, uh, be, uh, to review cases for anybody, uh, whether I work for, uh, the city of New York or as I did later on for the state police or whether there's a family wishes to have a separate, uh, evaluation of cause of death. Uh, so it isn't, it's just like at Bellevue. Uh, it didn't matter who came into Bellevue Hospital, whether it was, uh, the most uh, honest people in the world or the, or the criminals and drug addicts in the world. When they come in, a doctor is supposed to treat the patient to, to get well, no matter if he's a good guy or a bad guy. And I think the same thing uh, works with medical examiners. I think with OJ, you're getting into an interesting point there. I was involved uh, with um, uh, actually uh, the, the Innocence Project people, uh, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, who started the Innocence Project, just to find out whether he w- what what the cause of death was and whether um, uh, what and what we do 
as a medical examiner, as a doctor, for the prosecution or the um, defense is to determine the strength and weaknesses of the positions of, uh, involved from a scientific point of view. And I think that um, um, I testified for the, um, for the defense in the criminal case, and he was found not guilty. I gave the same testimony in the, uh, in the uh, civil case in which it was found um, uh, for the opposite side, for the uh, plaintiff. Um, and my testimony was the same, but the different witnesses were different. Uh, were different. As a result of that, though, um, there were a lot of... Uh, I was working for the New York State Police at the time as the chief uh, 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 forensic pathologist. There were a lot of the state police were upset at my uh, working for the defense. Um, and there were other lawyers around... Uh, who um, uh, were pleased that there was somebody around who would uh, say it the way it is, even if he gets fired from his job by the mayor, you know, uh, on that. And that's really how I met some of the people, as I said, like Johnny Cochran and uh, Ben Crump in the civil rights area. Well, yeah, and you should be able to speak the mind. It's science, right? You should be able to say what, what you know from your knowledge it shouldn't be so political for either side yeah it should be either side. but however uh we all are growing silos you know better than me if we, from your from where you work is that people have silos especially politically uh you know my guy right or wrong and uh the facts often uh, aren't persuasive, but I think doctors have to go by facts. We're going right now uh, through a big uh, discussion about, you know, uh, how do you do protection to COVID-type viruses? And even the cause, did it come from China? Did it come from a laboratory or did it come from natural uh, animals? And uh, even doctors and scientists are getting into uh, politi polit political uh, uh, silos on those accounts. So our world is changing rapidly, uh, but I'm still, you know, from the old-fashioned world where doctors are supposed to be independent uh, uh, physician scientists who help uh, people get better regardless of their po politics and, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to uh, use our expertise for everybody, not just for people who think like us. So what do you hope people get out of your book, like when they take it home and read it? What is it you were hoping? Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the book uh, goes through about 20 uh, cases, my per personal cases I've been involved with testifying. Well, you mentioned uh, things like uh, Martin Luther King and also John F. Kennedy. I was asked to uh, review his death for the Congress. But uh, Medgar Evers and... Uh, um, people you've never heard of and how they die uh, during police encounters and uh, how things can be done to prevent such deaths. And, and the most important thing I think now is we don't even have a database to uh, tell us the extent of the problem of deaths during police encounters, uh, the numbers of cases, how they occur, even though many times when they occur, uh, they can cause all kinds of civil uh, divisions. Uh, the last one, Tyree Nichols, uh, has caused a lot of fuss. So did George Floyd and, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. Uh, well, in between, now two years between them, there have been about 4,000 deaths uh, estimated between police encounters in the U.S., some of them, like the shooting cases, uh, get collected by newspapers because it's easy to get shooting, police shooting deaths from death certificates. But the, the cases like George Floyd and Eric Garner in New York, uh, uh, who died during back compression, or Tyree Nichols, would not normally be picked up uh, by um, uh, death certificates because they get disguised in, in, in names like... Uh, uh, excited delirium, undetermined uh, drugs, when they are police effects. And uh, we have to have some national uh, um, database where all these cases get reported. Any death during a police encounter gets reported to a, um, a central, federal, uh, national uh, body. 
Congress set this up in 2013, but it was voluntary, and the police departments don't cooperate. They're not submitting their cases to it. There has to be a mandatory kind of um, submission. And then once we know, that, is it just bad apples, or is it a whole culture of how police are trained and are they being trained accurately and uh you know that when somebody says I can't breathe, you gotta be careful and respect that, and uh, and uh, let him breathe. You know, for example. Yeah, it's an interesting scenario, right? Uh, on on how it is. Do police act differently around you when you take on these cases? When you go and testify for, like, let's say George Floyd, and become public, do you, do you find a a distance by the police? A little bit, yes. I do, I do, uh, and that's um, you know it's it's um, it, it, it has to be a learning process better than we're doing. But the problem is is that you know uh, one thing comes along like like George Floyd, and for reasons hard to understand, suddenly his death, like the thousands of deaths that occur in, in police custody, which uh, nobody which which doesn't. Um, uh, get any publicity. It's just the families and the local community that get upset by it uh, indicate that there's got to be uh, more of an understanding of what's happening, why minority communities are so upset because it's a higher incidence of deaths in, uh, in blacks, Hispanics, than in uh, Caucasians uh, doing the same activities, uh, and why... Uh, Especially now with social media. In the old days, with that before social media, uh, these used to just be deaths in the community, in a local community. Now any death can be national, and uh, there is always a possibility of more eruptions going on uh, internally uh, if we don't address the problem and try to figure out strategies. And the only way you can do that is at first. Uh, collect, uh, find out how extensive the problem is, which we don't know yet, and that's why we need to take place. Yeah, I have to I have to wonder if it's really if it's really about a broken system or a system that just wasn't set up properly to begin with. I, I think I think you you're very perceptive on that. I think you're right. I think then we get back into things like. Uh, uh, if I were born into, if my grandparents were born into slavery, and uh, I grew up uh, uh, under those uh, conditions, and never always being a second-class citizen, and, and not knowing um, uh, my standing uh, uh, in the community, uh, and uh, you know whether there's. Uh, um, hostility to me because of my uh, color or religion or something, then I uh, would become more of a, an outsider and do outside things because I have nothing to lose. And I think that that's kind of built into the system we have. And it's time now that we, uh, we, we're making great progress among recognizing. After, when, when our country was founded, in 1776, uh, women had no rights, uh, blacks had no rights, uh, no rights, um, immigrants didn't have rights, uh, properly. Uh, now we've made a lot of progress since then, but we've got a, 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 a long way to go. And I think what's happened is some of the divisions in society, uh, compounded by publicity giving to bad events that happen, and the worst kind of bad event is, is a death. So if, uh, if somebody dies uh, in, in, in uh, this divisive uh, time, it can unleash a lot of uh, hostility uh, uh, toward the lack of um, quality that should be present uh, at this time in our, uh, in our country's development and the world's development. So of all these cases, I, um, I have to imagine that each case has its toll on you or something. like. Um, which, which was the case that you think um, had the most effect on you or changed you the most afterwards? 
Um, I, I guess by by sent the, the reason I wrote the book was uh, when I got involved with was asked to do the second autopsy on uh, George Floyd because even then when with all the publicity and, and I was asked to come out there because um, at the time I was uh, 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 what do you call it uh, con- uh, convalescing or, or or not convalescing but sort of hiding uh, outside of New York City. With the COVID uh, uh, pandemic going on, uh, and trying to uh, getting older as I am, I, I'm a target for the COVID uh, bad uh, results. Uh, so my wife and I were away, and I got a call from Benjamin Crump, who's been involved in this as a lawyer, and uh, that the family was shocked, as I was, when after Floyd died and after the videos were shown of him. The medical examiner, the prosecutor, came out and said, uh, "Hey, the the um, autopsy shows that the um, uh, action of the police, the action of the police in restraining uh, Floyd, had nothing to do with his death, and his death was probably due to heart disease and uh, drug overdose, drugs." Uh, well, I thought that was outrageous because. Uh, autopsy doesn't show uh, that there's uh, compression on the back or on the neck uh, that um, and that the video showed that there was excessive use of force and he was calling out I can't breathe I can't breathe what 27 times so I thought that was this was kind of a uh, distillation of um, the cases I had seen where people died of uh, during similar restraining uh, processes, that um, uh, the second autopsy showed that the inability to breathe with strength was the cause of death and not other things like uh, drugs and um, drugs and other things, because very few people, very few um, uh, conditions causes rapid loss of death. The only time you get a quick re- a, a loss of death, quick death, is from uh, heart disease or inability to breathe. Uh, I went uh, up there, and when uh, I went there, uh, uh, I was uh, there's another doctor was called in on it, um, uh, and uh, we did the autopsy. Uh, and uh, taking into account the, the circumstances at the scene, as well as the autopsy findings, uh, were uh, able to show that this was uh, uh, a restraint uh, asphyxia and not drug abuse or uh, uh, heart disease, as the prosecutor and medical examiner had uh, had already uh, stated to the uh, to the public, and I think that that, that had a big uh, effect. It's been, it's been the next two years uh, trying to write this book together to show how what happened to Floyd is similar to what happens to other uh, minority groups. Uh, in encounters with police, and then this gets covered up by the cause of death uh, seeming to have nothing to do with the um, uh, what happened to the uh, uh, happened uh, shortly after Floyd. There was another fellow named Green, a uh, black guy who was in a car. Uh, the, the police uh, got behind him because um, uh, there was something wrong with the car, some minor violation. Uh, he took off. Ran about, uh, he drove about two blocks and crashed into some uh, some uh, bushes. The police uh, are seen on a video uh, dragging him out of the car. He's perfectly healthy, complaining, uh, you know, apologizing for not stopping right away. He's um, in the body cams. He's hazed. Uh, he's pepper sprayed. He shackled arms and legs, beaten, and dies. When the autopsy, this is down in Louisiana, when the, uh, uh, aut- when the death certificate is issued, it says um, auto- automobile crash is the cause of death, period. And so you, you, there's no way of collecting these and understanding how we have to improve how these cases are handled, especially when they have so much social significance, and uh, that's why I think that we have to have, in my writing the book, in part to show that uh, we have to develop strategies to uh, prevent deaths. And uh, the, uh, first, we've got to start with uh, 
a database that uh, accounts for uh, uh, how many people die in the police encounters so that police can improve and the communities can feel better. So did you did you foresee this career happening for you when Ed Koch had you demoted back there in the 70s? No, that, that you'd ask us something about the, that. No, when, when, when Koch, uh, when Koch, uh, do, he did, he demoted me from chief to deputy chief because Robert Morgenthau didn't feel I was a team player. Uh, you know, that I didn't, the, 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 the medical examiners didn't automatically support what the district attorney's theories of the case were. Um, you know, like we wouldn't say, that uh, person was uh, stabbed and raped when the person was only stabbed and not raped. You know, the the rape makes made it in some cases a lot uh, better case to present to a jury, um, even though it wasn't true. So that uh, if that hadn't happened, I suspect I would have stayed in New York City for the you know till time to retire. And uh, instead, when I uh, uh, I was able to, uh, I was then solicited by the New York State Police to uh, set up a forensic science unit uh, using um, forensic uh, doctors and uh, forensic dentists. And um, I spent time there where I was able to then do private practice as well, which I couldn't do really with uh, being full time in New York City. And that's how I got involved with uh, other lawyers getting in touch with me who felt that uh, they needed somebody who could say things differently, uh, you know, have a separate opinion and not just uh, be uh, find opinions that supported uh, the prosecutors. Well, it sounds like trying to tell the truth has served you well. Well, uh, it, it, it has. I mean, it made my life more interesting. I think I would have had a calmer life if I stayed in New York City. But uh, look, most of my... Uh, 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 doctor colleagues that I worked with and that uh, and that um, I went to medical school with uh, are retired, you know, living in Florida and playing golf or something. That's the last thing that I want to do. <laughs> I, I like what I'm doing, uh, and um, uh, so that uh, what a way for the good and the bad and the, the bumps and that, that come into it. Uh, it all made my me feel very interested in life and not ready to retire. How do you think um, a, a database can be put together where it'll be working, it'll be efficient? Because when you when you're trying to keep track of the the deaths that happen in police custody, who's to say how the death happened? Like who's going to give that uh, an analysis? Yeah, well, that's that's very good. Firstly. There has to be um, a, a, a national board uh, uh, that, that accepts the data. But what the Congress tried to do in 1913, 1914 was make a um, uh, this, uh, recognizing that there was a problem because we have all kinds of things. We, uh, we know how many people get gonorrhea in this country. We know how many people get food poisoning. We have national databases on uh, all kinds of things, uh, toys that go awry, but there's no da national database on how many people die uh, I I as a result of, uh, of, in police custody. It would be easy to do because right now, anybody who dies from any cause, natural, unnatural, suicide uh, involving the police and, and jails are out, um, uh, have to go to the med a medical examiner, not to, not to the police. They, the, what Congress tried to do is get the police to report the cases. Medical examiners should report all cases that uh, involve police, period. And then a national board, which I'll get to, uh, would look into the cases and see what makes sense, which don't make sense, what they want to investigate, get more history if necessary, or else keep just keep a record of how many die of shootings, how many die during restraint, how many die of natural causes, um, and um, the reason I say this is doable, one of the reasons uh, that Attica hap uh, uh, happened, which I go into in the book also about uh, uh, going up and doing re-autopsies on all the deaths in Attica, was uh, because the inmates felt that when people died in Attica, um, the uh, whether it's from 
uh, being beaten up by the uh, correctional officers, by suicide, by bad, bad medical care, by uh, natural causes, the bodies were always sent to the local hospital outside of the prison, the hospital emergency room, and uh, uh, they were always signed out as heart disease because that's what they were told. They were told, the doctors were told, well, he had chest pain and he died. So he signed out as heart disease. There weren't no autopsies. And the inmates knew that they, this was uh, false, uh, but nobody else did. So I was pulled up uh, to go to Attica uh, to do re-autopsies and, uh, uh, on the uh, deaths after, after the, the uh, prison was retaken. Afterwards, um, I was asked about how to prevent it, and I was dealing with a congressman, uh, uh, John Dunn, actually, who was in charge of the uh, prison subcommittee for the state senate. And uh, who was very interested in, in uh, the uh, in, in prisons in, around the state, and just we decided, and he decided that the best way to do this would establish a five-member board, uh, uh, a, uh, a sheriff, uh, a psychiatrist, a community worker, a lawyer, and a forensic pathologist to look at every death that occurred in all the prison states and lockups. Uh, in New York State, to see uh, which ones were preventable, for example. But in order to do that, we had to look at all of them. Now, in those days, there were about 300 deaths a year in the, in the prisons, uh, jails, and lockups in New York State, and uh, that's a doable number. You know, we would uh, meet uh, once uh, every two months or so, go through the cases. Uh, most people die of natural causes. There were a lot of suicides. We made recommendations. Uh, how to prevent suicides once we knew the number. The, the easiest thing was done is that when we looked at the suicide, the leading cause of death at that time in the 1970s uh, in uh, these jails and lockups was uh, hanging suicide in the uh, john because, um, you know, otherwise they were observed. They went into the take a shower and they'd be able to hang themselves. We just uh, uh, told them that they had to put... Uh, breakable uh, uh, bars on the uh, for the uh, shower curtains so if you try to hang it set themselves with nobody around they would it would break they fall to the ground that limit that limited and uh, suicides tremendously they can they don't have any guns that they don't have any uh, ways of otherwise committing suicide so that immediately to this day has diminished among the number of hanging suicides that uh, had occurred uh, prior, back in the 70s. But we had, and just looking at the cases, finding the deaths, and as soon as you have somebody doing oversight, they'd set up this board that did, uh, for the commission of correction that had oversight over the department of correction, uh, who, who were in charge of the prisons. And... Um, uh, the uh, just setting up an oversight immediately causes people we found to be more careful. They know somebody's going to be looking at what's going on. Uh, that has uh, um, dramatically cut down the number of deaths that occur in um, in, in in prisons and jails around the state. So I think here setting up a, bo a board. That's mandatory reporting from coroners and medical examiners. Uh, all death doesn't matter what the cause of death is: accident, suicide, homicide. If it's a if, if it's a death in uh, in a complete police confrontation, whether shooting or whether uh, dying uh, during a restraint, most people who die who are restrained don't die. If they die during the restraint, it would all be uh, mandatory reporting by the coroner and medical examiner to a national statistical thing, and you can find out immediately uh, how many deaths there are. Uh, you, you look through them, see which um, meet the criteria of uh, preventable deaths or something, uh, That um, and just a few number of people could do this. You'd know how many people um, uh, uh, died. You'd know whether it was due to a bad apple or a culture of being a, uh, that has to be corrected. And you'd be able to develop strategies to uh, 
uh, to prevent them, like the the strategy we had we had for breakable bathroom uh, curtain rods. We we found that there were a number of deaths in um, uh, when somebody was acting out, an inmate acting out, and uh, came in with uh, tear gas. Uh, under tear gas, inmates, when the tear gas was over, somebody, the inmate be dead, but nobody saw what happened. The guards were there with masks on, the inmate was there. We made, made up a rule that in order to, um, to, uh, use tear gas, the, the, the correction officers offended, um, couldn't do, go in by themselves. They had to have a supervisor from another place in the, in the prison who would come there with different, uh, um, uh, uh, correction officers to, to uh, do what had to be done with the inmate, uh, and uh, deaths didn't occur. Since our board was, I'm still on that board. I was appointed to that board. I'm still on that board, appointed by eight governors. Um, that um, uh, there has been no death in, in uh, from an uprising in a New York system prison. Because the prisoners and the lawyers for the prisoners know that every death is reviewed by this board, and uh, that when we when there's plea, when the correction officers made a mistake, we say we would say so, and when they haven't made a mistake, we say so. Uh, and I think just having some kind of commission like that, some kind of a place where all these uh, deaths have to be reported, uh, will make. Uh, Police uh, and uh, prosecutors and uh, medical examiners aware that everything is being reviewed outside of their system. You know, it's one thing in a county, everybody may help each other, uh, but uh, there'll be a, 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 a different system that looks at it and um, makes recommendations. And I think that's certainly a way to begin. Sounds good, and I hope it works out. Our guest. Dr. Michael M. Bodden, his book is out now, American Autopsy. Of course, it's at all bookstores and Amazon, and you can even find it on our website, just one click. Thank you very much, Michael. Alan Warren uh, and uh, uh, Mike Brown, uh, great to meet you guys. Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks, Doc. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, Hosts or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is the production of something weird media. I'll be back.